board. All right, so welcome to the March 4th edition of the TSC meeting. Um, I'm hosting the call today as Arno is on a plane. Uh, so there's two things that we must do in order to attend this meeting, although I think everybody on this call already knows this. Obviously, the first thing is the antitrust policy notice, which is being displayed on the screen now. And the second one is to um, live by the code of conduct. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the first thing that we have is a set of announcements. Uh, the first one is the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter. If you have any content, uh, please consider adding comments to the wiki page to include that content in the, the weekly developer newsletter. The second thing here is the mentorship program. Uh, so a week from now is the timeline for all proposals being submitted to the mentorship program. So if you have a good idea, uh, please submit the, the proposal. And then the last one is a week from tomorrow, the uh, CFP for the Hyperledger Global Forum closes. Any other announcements that anybody might have? Okay, uh, so the next thing is the quarterly reports. Uh, so we don't have reports from Borough for the quarter and we don't have uh, the quilt one yet. Uh, it was due this week. So uh, the one that we do have is the cello one. Yeah, Dano. So Burrow is coming up on three weeks late for a report and we didn't get a Q4 report. At what point does this become an issue? Yeah, so um, Arno and I were talking about this. We need to reach out to Silas uh, to see about getting a report. We do see that there's activity going on in the actual GitHub repo. So um, there's actual work being done. It's not like it's been uh, completely abandoned, if you will. Um, so we just need to reach out to Silas and see if we can get him to give us a, a report. So um, Arno mentioned that he was going to do that. So we'll uh, we'll give him the opportunity to do that and see if we can get back a response from, from Silas and the borough community. All right, uh, so on the cello one, uh, the only thing that I saw in the cello one was a call for uh, front end developers. So if you or anyone you know might be interested in um, contributing to cello as a front end developer, they are looking for people to contribute. But uh, other than that, I didn't see any other questions or concerns being raised. Does anybody have any, any questions or concerns on this that we should raise on the call? Okay, I'll take silence as a no. All right, so uh, the topic for today is to discuss uh, how we come up with ideas of how we break down the silos. Um, so Arno has been requesting for you know the, the last week, two weeks to, for us to be commenting on these, uh, these ideas around what, uh, what came out of this discussion with the SIGs. This one um, has had some discussion, but it mostly focused on uh, lab sponsors and, and thinking about that. And there is a discussion that's ongoing there. What I wanted to specifically talk about with this particular one is the, the silos that we have within Hyperledger and how we might go about uh, breaking down some of those silos. So in thinking about the silos that we do have, we've got the labs, we've got the projects, the working groups, the SIGs, um, even TSC could be considered a silo based on uh, one of the emails that came out this week on the list that uh, we, I think it was on the maintainers list actually, um, that the, the projects don't often listen to the TSC and, and what we're coming up with. Uh, there's also been comments around knowing what the decisions are from the TSC. So, uh, just want to open the floor and see if anybody has any ideas or, or thoughts. Uh, this is our time to, to kind of brainstorm around how we go about breaking down the silos that we do have within Hyperledger. Uh, 
Hi, Tracy. It's Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Um, I agree with the silos because every time I go to one of the um, SIG calls or the working group calls or um, one of the project calls, the information that they have is, is so important. But again, it's just there. Um, and I think this is something that can be worked on. I don't know if the newsletter is the way to communicate. Um, I find that what the developers newsletter messages is awesome and it, it gets out to everybody. Maybe we can incorporate, because communication is definitely one of the ways I think you can break down these silos. So maybe the newsletter is a way to, you know, once we have a, a centralized location for this stuff, um, announce where it is for everybody to benefit from. Is that the right track of what you were talking about? That's a, that's a good idea. Um, so how do we get people to contribute to the developer newsletter? I mean, obviously we have a call um, every week on, on this, you know, we have a call on this call, right? Every week to, to have people contribute, but how do we, how do we spread that beyond just uh, the people who are joining the call and get other people to recognize that this newsletter is really a community driven news newsletter? Is there a column or something in the newsletter that, you know, like the, TSC chairman's re column or something, or you know, act what's going on in the TSC every every week or something. Or if, if I might, say. there there's uh, no, but there's no reason that it couldn't be. Um, the the newsletter is for the developer community, which includes pretty much everybody on this call, right, to decide what the content is. Um, and I see that uh, both. I think Gary raised his hand first and then David Boswell. Thank you. Well, I'll just say, I, I'll just, I, I'm kind of like a broken record, but I don't know how you break down barriers when you have no unified mission. There's no unification, right? A SIG, what's the SIG for, right? It just not, doesn't make sense, right? There is a pipeline from lab, I mean, there theoretically was a pipeline from, you know, lab, you know, starting out in labs, right, to become a real project, right? So we, I mean, we've talked that at nausea in the last couple of meetings, um, you know, or, or at least that's in there, but like, you know what I mean? It's like nobody ever translates of all the things, right? I don't, I don't even know that I've ever seen anything that came out of a, and it might be true that this, I might have missed it, that ever was a requirement written against a product. Or I mean, one of the projects, never seen it, right? They write it in a document, but we have Jira or Git issues, right? Nothing in there, right? Or then what are we actually trying to accomplish? Um, so I don't really know how you can have a breakdown barrier silos when there's no, there's no unified mission for Hyperledger. I'm just going to keep saying that every time. I don't think there is one. I think it's a potpourri of things and when you get a potpourri of things you get silos okay thanks gary and david i have a couple things that have come up in different discussions uh that i'll, I'll share here because i think there are some concrete things we could do uh, um so just to give one example uh, um you know tracy last year had you know, presented the idea of having contributed thons and we've, you know, recently presented on the idea of, you know, we tried that last year and we presented on the idea of how that worked, but the, the pilot effort that we did for that was looking at just one project. So I guess that was not helping break out the silos, but I think there's the potential for doing these going forward in a way that it would break the silos. So to point out two things where I think they could be good models for trying to address this issue. Uh, so, for example, we, we reached out to Dano to see if he would be interested in doing something to, to this. And Dano, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were saying that you were interested in doing something that would be cross-project collaboration. So I think that would be a good example of addressing silos. And it could address two different things. So, for example, Dano, if I remember correctly, you said if we did something for Bezu, you would be interested in having it be focused on having Bezu work with Explorer and Cello. So that could be, doing that could be a nice way of identifying where there are points of uh, you know 
interest in cross project efforts and then supporting those and it you know we just saw in the cello report that they're interested in having more front end developers so maybe if we do that we can also get them some more attention so i think there are actually points where there's interest in some cross collaboration and if we foster that and show that it's a viable model maybe that would bring up more and just to throw out one other example on on monday we had a, a conversation with the climate SIG about a lab they're doing and Peter from the Cactus Project came there because the SIG is interested in using Cactus and he did want to hear what the requirements were. He is invested in making sure that they could evolve Cactus so it is something that they could use in that particular use case and they, they are also talking about um, figuring out ways that they can collaborate together. So I think there are actually some examples out there. I think it takes time and effort to go out and listen and hear what all of the 16 projects are interested in doing what all the active labs are doing and then somebody needs to do that brokering to see where there's overlap and then support those so i think that is one thing that could be done and there are some initial points there i think the other thing goes to a, a conversation we had recently about how critical relationships are in an open source community and how people who don't have those relationships also sometimes get ignored you know i think one thing that came up in that thread tracy's talking about is mentorship but i realize mentorship is a uh, probably not the right word for that because there's a mentorship program and what we're talking about is separate from that. So maybe we can come up with a better name for it, but maybe liaisons. I think if we help foster and build relationships, that would help uh, address some of these things and get people out of silos. So one thing that I think came up in that thread would be, what if people on the TSC adopted one of the working groups or special interest groups or labs or what have you for a set period of time. I mean, it wouldn't have, need to be a huge, huge commitment, you know, one quarter, two quarters and goes, you know, and the, they go to the regular calls, they have relation, you know, they do some relationship building activities, maybe have some one on ones with some of the key stakeholders, but I think we could foster some of those, uh, you know, relationships and cross project collaboration if we did have some sort of an active liaison um, effort. And again, I think that's just community building best practices. I think when you have the key stakeholders, the key contributors in a community paying it forward and, you know, helping onboard and bring new people into the fold, those people then have those relationships and are then set up more for success going forward and have a better view of the landscape. I think part of the issue that we're, we live in silos is because people never have the opportunity to meet people outside of the groups they go to. They go to the SIG meeting, they go on the SIG chat channel or mailing list. They're only in that one bubble. Like, can we create some linkages across those places? So, I mean, would people on the CSC be comfortable adopting a lab or a, a SIG or a working group for a set period of time? You know, I think those are two concrete things we could do. David, a question for you. You mentioned Peter and the climate Mm -hmm. uh, SIG, right? Um, so how did that come about? Was that because the SIG reached out on the cactus list or did somebody have a relationship with Peter? Like what, what was the kind of the process for that happening? Um, well, Sai was a lot of this behind it. So he may have a different story to say, but I think some of it at least, I mean, a lot goes to his credit for he, he was reaching out, but a lot of it was Sai didn't even know where to begin reaching out. So I go to those climate action calls regularly. I heard that they were talking about being interested in other projects. So I kind of walked them through, how do you communicate with those other projects? And then again, to Sai's credit, once he got pointed in the right direction and understood the dynamics, he then went to go talk, have some conversations on those lists. So if you look at the cactus list, mailing list, for example, you'll see Sai so reached out, told him what they're doing, had a discussion there. So I think that's a, a really positive example. If it's helpful for the group, I can pull up the mailing, the mailing list thread here so you can see. But um, Sai so did a lot of the heavy lifting, but he had to, somebody had to help him understand how the dynamic worked. And again, I think we have a situation where there's 70 plus places where you could go to have these discussions where you could go to find code that you might be able to, you know, do. So somebody needed to help orient the climate group to understand what the landscape and the community even was to begin with, right? So, but once they had their bearings, I think, you know, open source worked, right? They showed up, they had a scratch stitch, they talked to the right people and now they're off and running, right? But there was kind of a liaison-ish, you know, starting point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other thoughts?
I, I had a question for David. Are the two cactus and the climate sig like just talking about things or are like people from the climate sig actually starting to put code back into cactus? Uh, so here, if it's helpful, I can grab the link. But so what the initial conversations here, here, this one second. Oh, chat. Huh. Interesting. It's telling me chat is disabled for some reason. I don't know why that is. Yeah, I, I disabled that to drive it to the Oh, to the rocket channel. chat. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't or you wanna, can screen okay. share your, your Oh, no, no. Uh, I I mean, I'll put on rocket chat. Um, so I dropped on the rocket chat, the lab. So that, yes, that is starting. So Peter is, again, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but my understanding is Peter is motivated to understand what the requirements are for the lab. And he wants to have Cactus do what the lab is wanting to do. So I don't know if, I don't believe Cy or anybody in that group has yet delivered things. It's still, you know, exploratory and initial. We had a conversation on Monday. Without going into the weeds too much, we are seeing if there's something we can do to help promote the lab for Earth Day, because Earth Day is coming up in April. So, you know, I joined to see if there's things that we could do to help um, kind of package up what they're doing and promote it out l later in April. And the cactus work is part of that. So Peter had talked about going through the cactus a list of bugs, tagging things, not just as good first bug, but tagging them as, you know, specifically for that lab. And then once we have that list from uh, from Peter, you know, we can then work with Cy and his group and then promote that out. So I can go into the more of the weeds, but that's the short version of the answer, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. And Dano, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like you, you, I mean, that was another example. You sounded like you were interested in places where, you know, Bezu could work with other projects. So we could do a similar thing with it, understand where those touch points are, document some bugs as, you know, things where they're, you know, use whatever tag we want, you know, good first issue plus, you know, you know, Bezu and yeah. or whatever. And I mostly got that from looking at the, um, at the greenhouse and realizing that the only two projects that don't support Ethereum directly where the explorer and someone's just like, we should just, you know, finish the list so that they're all, and it helps these two projects because those two don't have a strong multi blockchain backend as a generic tool either. So it would strengthen both projects. Yeah. And, and we could, I mean, there's, I mean, if that's something we choose to do, we can do, you know, the same thing that we're doing, you know, to promote these other contribution opportunities, such as the fabric documentation translation or the bath lab stuff that we've shared here before. So, I mean, that's, it's within our power to do that if we want to foster cross-project collaboration. Okay. So, so far I've heard, let me just recap what I've heard and see if this sparks any additional thoughts from folks. Um, I've heard communication is key, and maybe we can use the developer newsletter. Building on top of that is uh, maybe including a what's going on in TSC in that newsletter every week. And um, Gary said we need a unified mission, which I think I agree with, Gary. Uh, Contributathons across projects, uh, brokering or fostering relationships, and um, David, you also said another thing, which I uh, have wrote down, which is, and I don't think you meant to say this, but I, I think it's important. The opportunity to meet others um, is another piece of this. I think, uh, you know, we used to have the Hackfest uh, pretty much on a quarterly basis, and uh, that gave us the opportunity to meet people that we might not have other met, otherwise met in the community. Um, so, you know, that that I think is a, a missing piece, right? As we've grown, we've uh, decreased those, right? And, and now we're not having those. And obviously a lot of that is the environment in which we live today, but, you know, that's, a, that's something that maybe we could consider and think about. Um, so other things that that list of things has brought to your your mind as something you'd like to contribute to the discussion anyone so with respect to hackfest those were typically more geared for the developers so that would improve 
cross project communication, but it wouldn't necessarily help with SIGs, right? Um, I'm wondering with a CFP for the global summit, I don't know if it would be appropriate to discuss, are we seeing um, proposals from the SIGs as well as projects or is it geared more towards just projects? If, if it's fair to comment on that or not. Because that would be an opportunity for people to go and find out what's going on in the SIGs if the SIGs were doing presentations. I am not sure and I don't know. I think uh, Daniela or Marta might know that, but I also don't know if we can disclose that at this point. Daniela? I'm sorry, Ryan, what was the question? Uh, are, SIGs, uh, are SIGs responding to the RFP for, um, for Global Forum? Uh, I know many of them are planning on doing so because we've had a couple of you know queries and coaching questions from them. Um, so I would say yes, but you're right. We can't disclose that yet. Right. So the answer, Mark, is uh, absolutely. We've encouraged the SIGs to um, do CFPs individually, the SIG participants, and also the SIGs as, as a group to come up with themes um, to submit CFP talks based on the themes of those SIGs and the work that they've been doing within the SIG. So it would be great if people from the TSC and, and others in the development community could go to those presentations uh, if they're accepted or the ones that are accepted. That'd right. be great, yeah. And we would, we'd be happy to summarize those when, when they get finalized. Yeah, and just to build on that, I mean, Danielle is right. We have encouraged SIGs to submit to the, the Global Forum CFP and also the mentorship uh, deadline, which is coming up. And I just dropped a link in the TSC chat as well. Some some groups have, and, and just to flag, if I remember correctly, Vipin, when he presented about the to the TSC recently, mentioned that the telecom SIG had submitted mentor proposals in the past, but didn't get accepted. So, you know, if if people at the TSC want to keep an, an eye out for any SIG related uh, proposals this year, that could be uh, potentially uh, an interesting project. I, I'm going to uh, propose something that I've put all of like several seconds into thought about. Um, so this is a very rough idea. Uh, what if there was like a pitch slide like I, a dozen words tops for each project, like what they want and how they want to work, you know, where they, where they see opportunities. And we could have, you know, for each of the, the labs or the SIGs or whatever, we could just have a very like two item thing. This is who we are, this is what we do. This is where we need help, or this is what we would like to do. So it was much easier than digging through JIRA. It, again, it would add another point of contact, but it would be a lot shorter. I don't know. Right. It's an interesting thought. I think um, one thing that came to my mind is could we use the Hyperledger Twitter account for something like that? Right. Which I think would expand beyond just the, the typical community. Right. Um, but, you know, I think the what, who we are and, and, where are we looking for other people to come join us is, is an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, plus one. Daniela? No, yeah, I'm just plus, plus one as well, but we've also discussed taking our job board, our public job board and, you know, renaming it, but using that um, to, um, you know, basically advertise work or opportunities that people in the in in the projects are looking for, the working groups and the projects are work, are looking for volunteers to work on. Yeah, that is another good idea, and that should be on the list because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, or know or somebody else pointed out as well. But I mean, yeah, sometimes the, the collaboration just doesn't happen because you just don't have the visibility into, hey, this other group is doing something that. You know, I'm also interested in. There's just too many places for one person to, you know, you can't read every list, right? 
or, or every chat channel. So if we if we surface stuff that's happening, it might be easier to foster those collaboration points. Other thoughts? Uh, aside from Mark, is anyone here on a working group? I know that Mark is a working group chair for the Perp and Scale. And okay, Bobby. Learning Materials Working Group. And I'm an active member of the Social Impact SIG and the Public Sector SIG. Grace? I'm on the DCI Working Group. Is there any way that, uh, you know, for those, is there anything that we could do, we, this form, could do to you know, make more connections there between what the DCI working group and learning materials working group and perp and scale working group need or want? Is there, do you see anything that, any opportunities there? I think the global forum is going to be a great um, showcase to expose what's going on in, in the working groups and SIGs. And again, I'm encouraging um, the learning materials working group to submit something. And I know that, um, I know David can probably talk more about the meetups, but I know that they're looking into doing something. So I think just in, if for those of us who do sit in on the SIGs in the, in the working groups to encourage them to do a submission for the global forum, because people need to know what they're up to and that's the best place to get uh, participants in consortiums, I think. All right, for those of you who haven't spoken up yet, uh, any thoughts? And Gary, I saw you came off mute. Oh, well, actually, I didn't mean to, but I do. I was going to raise my hand, but I just did that by accident. I, I was just going to say, you know, I was just thinking, you know, I made my, you know, comment as usual, but I, in listening to some of the points here and then thinking like, I, I know, for example, like, you know, from the documentation working group, right, we've actually had stuff that's been pushed in, but like, if we ever had if we ever had like an end to end thread that was something such as, and I heard some, I think some things that what was like, hey, a SIG or a working group, right? Let's say a SIG, let's say a, a, a group or an industry group, right? Comes up with something, a use case, they come up with some requirements. And then we say, all right, you know, maybe we should do like a, like a hack fest around that with maybe the result being potentially a lab project. And then you know, looking at incubating that lab project into where does it fit into one of the existing projects or a new project? Have we ever had anything that steered that entire course? Um, this is Daniela. Um, I know that the India regional chapter is currently, they're about to launch um, a hack, what's it called? A hack, uh, is it Runon? Uh, yeah. Yes. Hack um, a hack fest um, uh, and working in collaboration with the social impact SIG. Um, so that would be like, yes, yeah, so I think we've had some pairwise, right? Like we had, I, anyway, I was just thinking that, you know, we were thinking about how could you define like how things more interact. I was just thinking that maybe they're there. When you hear all the sort of pairwise things between different, whatever pillars or groups, like whether it be labs and projects or labs and whatever it may be, like, Maybe they're, I was just wondering if we ever actually had anything. And that's where I kind of meant like the unified kind of mission type thing, right? Because you could have, you know, we came in with a bunch of requirements around this. We wanted to prove out that, you know, we need these, we need to see these types of things in a blockchain platform. Hey, if more people are interested in contributing to that, could they, you know, do a hack fast to prove it out kind of like we used to do early on, maybe that results in a labs project and then maybe some other big project, either a new, hopefully not a new project, but then somebody else sort of picks it up. 
like that's kind of what I kind of meant by like having a mission. Cause if you kind of have like a mission, like an end state goal of like where you start from something and end with something, <laughs> you get more interaction, right? But isolation is kind of driven by the nature that they are isolated. Except like document, but like documentation is a good example because that's spread a lot of stuff like into groups and other things like that. So we, we have them kind of, but I guess that, you know, just thinking way back, right? That was part of the ideas of Hackfest way back when, and they never really resulted in that because they, they ended up being mostly um, getting users, you know, teaching people how to use existing projects. Anyway, I'll pause there. So that was just a, just a thought. If, if we ever had one, it would be a good exemplar to use. But maybe we should see if there's something in play right now that might fit that bill. Yep. Other folks' ideas. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks on the call that haven't spoken up yet, so um, this is your opportunity to add uh, add a twist to what we're thinking about as far as breaking down silos. Yeah, Arun. Hey, sorry, I, I had to join late today because of a conflict, so I don't know what the conversation is. If yeah, so Arun, we've been talking about uh, ways to break down the silos. Uh, between projects, labs, working groups, SIGs, the TSC. Um, and so there's been, it's mostly been a, a brainstorming sort of discussion. And uh, Nathan, I see you have your hand up. We're, we're a volunteer organization and a lot of people are, are contributing based on their own you know, current business plan. Um, I think the biggest part is how do we increase the amount of uh, exposure we have to each other's ideas. Um, we've talked a lot about having different groups come and present to one another. Um, we've talked about, you know, what happened at a lot of the hack fests in the past where you try to get people from different projects and SIGs to sit at the same table and talk about what they were working on. Um, uh, really, I think one of the questions here is how do we get as many opportunities as we can for people to brush shoulders with each other so that when there is an opportunity, we as a, as a community realize it more quickly and are able to mobilize people who find that problem interesting. Um, and, you know, we've had struggles getting people to contribute content to the newsletter. That's a great chance to try to promote your idea or to promote something you think um, uh, deserves more attention. Um, I think uh, we're, we're not going to be very successful when we try to make a procedure that forces people to collaborate or tries to you know, artificially push people um, to go to a group that they don't aren't very naturally motivated to, to go to. Um, but the more we can create tools that bubble these ideas up so, you know, as part of a report we see it, or as part of a newsletter we see it, or as part of the regular, you know, working group meetings that you're already attending, there's some influence or some announcements about what's going on outside of your own bubble, the better. Um, I, I don't know that I have specific ideas on how to make that happen other than, you know, every time we're doing an event, we need to think about how do we share what's going on outside or outside of that particular group, or how do we make those opportunities for people to talk to one another, like having an unconference day at Global Forum or having, you know, um, the net a ways of creating that kind of networking table type things that we've done in the past. Yeah, Nathan, I think um, at one point early, early this year, late last year, um, at the last uh, global forum, because it's March again, um, <laughs> there was a, a uh, decision made by the TSC that the project should share their RFCs with, uh, with a larger group, right? Like make an announcement of a new RFC that's been created within their project. We haven't seen any RFCs be announced anywhere. Obviously, that's us trying to force that communication to happen. Um, but yet it was a attempt at the idea of making people understand what's happening outside of their bubble. Um, so, you know, I think We've, we've tried, we've not succeeded. So we need to find a different way to, to try and make that happen. And so if there's ideas around, you know, that others might have, right? Because I think Nathan and I 
both recognize a, a, a challenge and probably everybody on this call recognizes that challenge, but is there a way for us to solve that challenge? I had one thought and I'll drop the link into uh, chat. And here, let me share my screen too. You know, we're talking about breaking out of bubbles and we're talking about maybe the newsletter being that channel. I mean, I guess one concern with that is that it needs to be manual. So as we're having this conversation, it occurred to me that I, from the Mozilla community, they have a nice, uh, uh, this is what something they call Planet Mozilla, but it's effectively trying to break out uh, uh, bubbles. Mozilla itself is a huge community with different parts of it. So this is more of a, just an automated aggregator. Again, I, I think maybe one of the downsides of the newsletter process is that again, people have to manually remember to, to do that. So this is just something that kind of is automated. So I don't know if maybe considering something like this, is there some way to just automatically aggregate conversations? I know we talked about automatically aggregating perhaps issues that different projects have you know submitted in their different project areas, but this would be a similar thing, but aggregating different types of conversations some sort of aggregator or mailing list aggregator or you know what have you twitter ag aggregator but some sort of thing that aggregates conversations to in one place could could help break bubbles so just this occurred to me while we were talking so i just wanted to share this too yeah I, and, uh, and go ahead Russ. um one thing that i was looking into thank you tracy was uh you can tag or can you tag uh, like releases or anything other than GitHub issues. So my thought was we have this thing that automatically aggregates bugs with good first issue. Uh, is it possible to tag uh, a discussion since some of the, or several of the projects have enabled uh, GitHub discussions for their projects like Fabric has that. Uh, can those be tagged? Can a release be tagged? as this is important or a PR be tagged without an associated bug. I haven't got to the end of that, but if those items can be tagged, then that might be a way that we could feed some of this data automatically. Right, you, you mentioned a, that we do have an aggregator for good first bugs across Hyperledger, is that true? Uh, we have a GitHub, we have a plugin for Confluence and it does pull uh, good first issues for a project, but I have not looked to see if I can pull it across an org yet. I will do that now. Okay, yeah, I, that's actually where I was gonna go um, when we both started talking at the same time is I, you know, we, in one of the other mailing list items that came out of the SIG was this idea of having a, an aggregation of those good first issues across projects, right? Or, and not only across the, the repos, but also kind of the uh, requests from, from SIGs or working groups or um, any, any sort of, you know, folks within the Hyperledger community of things that they need help with, right? Um, and so I think that could be a, a, an interesting if we could get a place where you could go, one place you could go and see all of the sorts of, um, you know, requests for help, if you will, uh, that that would be, I think, a, a really great, great start to solving some of this. Agreed. Um, here is the BAF version of this plugin. Um, so this is automatically you know, rendered whenever you visit the bath page. Oh, cool. So the, the next step would be, so this is the query right here. The next step would be to see if I can make that query uh, larger in scope, so. I think even, right, we could do something where it's per project or, or per lab, right? I mean, Obviously, that makes it a bit more difficult because there are a ton of repos. So, if there's something that can be automated. That's that's obviously better. Um, other other thoughts, other ideas. Is it the silo that we are trying to break across projects, or is it that 
gap which we are trying to avoid from users or, or new contributors with hyperledger because they both go um, in different streams. Arun, I think there's silo. I think there's so many silos, right? Um, okay. And we're just looking to see if there's ways uh, that we can come up with as ideas for breaking silos, any of the silos, right? Breaking down the silos, getting people to talk to one another, getting people to recognize that there's more stuff going on out there than than they may realize. Um, you know, being being able to foster and foster those relationships, right? Uh, awesome. So um, one thing from I can tell you from um, India chapter meetings because I I lead that aspect as well, right? So um, many people come to the call and they, they say, "Hey, I'm new to blockchain and I'm new to Hyperledger." And they say, "Okay, I'm new to Hyperledger Fabric." And when I read the documentation, it's so difficult. I don't know where to start contributions. And one of the asks which I always make on the call is, "Hey, you are all technical developers. Why don't you see that there are." few things and you have your free time you want to get involved here are the ways in which you can get involved so they feel it even even if we do it per project they still feel it okay i may not have enough information on the project to get started so where i what i was thinking about is can we have something like hey, here are the issues which are purely um, i mean you don't need to know deep into specific project it is more about let's say setting up some ci pipeline if you know how how this travis works then this this is all good if you know how github action works this is all good you go there pick it up start working on it so this is a way in which you can get introduced to the team at least and that that will further you into that specific project for contributions and the same thing could happen for um, documentation contributions or even if we can break it down till the level where we say here is here are the issues which will not require you to know uh, deep into any of this probably this is related to an example application or this is related to purely a programmatical aspect of it you get involved in in, in it so that could be a way um, but i don't know how to achieve it maybe it requires more tooling efforts or something that we need to develop which we don't have at all um, and one other thing which i which I'm personally working on with one of my team member is trying to figure out how many long pending PRs do we have on Hyperledger, right? I see few of, I mean, in fact, one of my PR is still waiting for more than two years now, uh, literally from the time I, I submitted and that time I was still like in my previous company. So these kind of experiences for new developers would really be um, a concern from the community. So I'm trying to get that metric out and uh, I wrote a simple tool to pull all the PRs which are pending for a long time. And similarly, if we can do uh, those kind of things with, I, the reason I, why I like this GitHub issue tagging is, is that um, we can really come up with those kind of tags which will define us or help us saying that you want to get involved into it and you are a java developer or you are good at documenting things that you are expert in specific language then here are the opportunities for you and another concern from within the projects is one of the concerns which i hear at least is so people think that they don't see a value in attending common meetings and this kind of comment I hear also for TSC meetings, unfortunately. So people think that TSC meetings are way um, beyond what they should be attending. So um, I see one way to bridge that would be, let's say we pick up projects which, which is not tied to one specific framework or platform uh, example. Uh, explorer right so that that could be developed or modeled for any of the ledgers and maybe aries there is an open opportunity for somebody to go and and develop um, like some interface which would abstract that away from indie or or if it is already done then that's still good right so those kind of aspects are where we can think about bringing together silos across different projects can we list down those on and try to target 
uh, through maintainer summits for those aspects. So I uh, agreed. I'm showing here on, on my screen, um, like the oldest open one is 1,084 days for Sawtooth. Um, so there are a lot of ancient PRs. How can we solve this? Well, what do you what exactly are you trying to solve though? What does solve mean? I guess I should. What's your definition of solve? Ours, we should not. I mean, we should not be having this kind of experience for first time contributors. Well, did you look, did you actually look in the poll request and did the first time contributor actually go back and ask if anybody had looked at it? I mean, I can tell you from my own experience, right, which is waiting for a long time. Um, nobody looked into it. Yeah, so on this one, it looks like there were changes requested in May of 2018. Um, so, I, I mean, this is just for a specific PR, but you know. Nathan? Sometimes I wonder if maybe as a TSC, we could put together some maintainer training. I know one, Thing that we had a lot of success with it, or I shouldn't say we, that the SALT project had a lot of success with, is they had uh, someone who was assigned to essentially do the first hit is free um, on pull requests. So that when you came to the project with a new contribution, there was a maintainer who would help you make sure your first pull request landed successfully. Um, and part of that was to help teach new contributors how the style guides worked, how code quality checks worked all of those things that might not be obvious when you first want to try to help. And it, it really uh, increased the amount of developer retention that they had um, and helped make the community feel a lot more welcoming. Now, obviously not all of us have the same level of resourcing or the same ability to, to do that, but um, is, are there some things we can, I know we, we, we pay attention to some metrics around diversity of contributors. We pay attention to some metrics about releases. We pay attention to some metrics about how long until people respond to a bug or how long until people respond to a pull request. Is there something we can do to help put this in the maintainers or in the minds of all the maintainers? Yep, good point. Sean? Sean, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, there you go. Yes, so, um, <laughs> one of the things um, I've been very keen on is, is to have some sort of code of conduct for, maybe doesn't, that's not the right word, but some sort of um, guide for uh, maintainers. So, it's not, it's, so a new, if someone's new to a project, can, can they can kind of look at the workflow of a project and see that uh, they can expect a PR to be sort of reviewed within a week or so, or two weeks or so. Um, and also, that um, if if a project isn't um, isn't behaving according to that according to the code of conduct, then there should be some sort of uh, some sort of pressure applied in some sort of way, because this really doesn't look very good. This really puts people off when when pull requests aren't aren't, aren't answered or not taken seriously. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know how this could be enforced in Hyperledger. I probably can't. Um, that's something along those lines. I was... Yeah, I I seem to recall that we've talked about like best practices, right, for maintainers in the past, but uh, I don't think that's ever gotten any traction. Um, Nathan, I really like the the Sherpa idea, if you will. Um, I had one, my very first contribution to Fabric, and that helped a lot, right? Um, 
I didn't know Garrett at all. And, and so just getting through that process was, uh, was quite painful, even though all I was trying to do is like make a spelling issue, right, fix. Um, so I, I think these are all really good ideas. Uh, Mark? I'm sure. sorry, Dave. Yeah, okay, Dave Mark, go ahead. Dave, go. Yeah, Dave. Right, so on the project reports, we recently had people put the link to their insights um, dashboard or whatever. So perhaps we put like an average age of PRs. Is there, I don't know if that's easily available, right? But if people could, you know, self-enforce by putting that in their report and we ask people to put that in their report, that would at least get them thinking about it and talking to the other maintainers about how can we reduce this metric? If, if I could like, um, uh, Yes, and what I would ask the TSC to do, and I asked this on, I think on the Fabric call and on the URSA call yesterday, was to give us, which is to say me, a concrete set of requirements to feed to the product team about what you want as, for example, as a badge or as a report. Hyperledger is way ahead of the curve for Linux Foundation. So you have a great opportunity to give input on what you're asking for what that should look like. Um, so, Mark? Yeah, I was actually gonna take it a step further um, and say, you know, we've talked about requirements and the badging, um, but, you know, the, if anything, the project should be making time to go through and clean up the old ones that may not be applicable anymore. Um, but again, you know, this happens outside of, you know, like, Within Red Hat, I know it happens that some of the old ones just sit there forever. I think they've cleaned up some of mine from 2010 recently. Um, so, but you know, there's a housekeeping that needs to happen. And, and does that become one of the metrics we look at for a project? Um, as we review all of that, I don't wanna open that can of worms right now for, the, for this call, but. You know, do we look at it as part of your status as how many old PRs you have and what you're doing? Yeah. Nathan? Well, and I think Mark's got the right of it in terms of it's about housekeeping. Sometimes I think the age of a PR is not necessarily the right metric, but how active it is or, or if, it, if it's being ignored. Um, on the balance of things, it, we often try not to be rude to someone and not be confrontational. And so, you know, in, instead of telling someone to jump in the lake, we tell we just ignore them all together. And it turns out that that second scenario is worse because then they don't know where they stand. Whereas if we can give them some clear feedback, they know what to do next. Um, so uh, this gets back to Rice's comment of, we need to have this conversation in the metrics thread of, you know, it's okay to use a pull request as kind of a working branch or, you know, a working discussion and it's okay for those discussions to take a long time. How do we make it so we have metrics that give us uh, meaningful outcomes in terms of helping people feel invited, helping them feel included, and helping them feel successful? Yeah, I think you get what you measure, right? And is it being ignored by the, um, by the maintainers? Is it being ignored by the person who originally created the PR, right? Who's ignoring it? And what's the reason for that ignoring happening? So. Um, you can tag um, pull requests. You can say needs info or so. So you can, if the maintainer can put a tag on it, if it needs it, um, input from um, the submitter. So we... okay. uh, I think Arun, you're next. Hey, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring up a point that I, I understand that auto close is not an option or people may not like it but we could at least have auto remind that kind of bots running, which would remind maintainers, hey, here is a PR maybe you overlooked into because you were busy last time. Maybe this is a chance well for you to go back and look into once. Jerry. Well, I think there's been some good ideas here too, but, 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 but I guess in the end, right? Um, I think sometimes we, I don't know, I, I, I always feel like, I mean, maybe I've had some bad experiences in other open source or whatever stuff that's in here. I think there's a lot of things like Nathan said that happen, right? There's definitely the notion that we, people do read it, but they don't comment because they're afraid. I get that. So we should probably, you know, you know, put that out there. 
but in the end, right? So if you, if you, if you come in and you issue a poll request and it doesn't get either for whatever reason, right? It gets ignored, nobody wants it, it gets rejected or whatever, then, I mean, then maybe you move on to another project. You have to make a decision what you wanna do, you know, with that project. So I guess, again, I sometimes I go back to, what are we, what do we think this is solving? Or, or should we have a forum that somebody can complain to or write to or whatever, right? It's like, hey, we've been contributing this critical stuff and nobody wants to accept our changes. There's a variety of things, right? But I don't know. I think I'm just going to put it out there. I think we like to coddle a little too much. Like, in, I don't know. And then we want to like track people to what they've done it. People, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm, not, I just, I'm, not, I'm not sure what we're trying to solve all the time, right? That we think that somebody's just going to come in or whatever. Has anybody intentionally ignored people? Probably not. Right. Just seems like we want to do a lot of coddling and I think people need to learn how to work in open source and that's the net net of it. Okay, uh, Sean. Um, well, just one step. Um, that there are um, contributors will move to an, onto another project if their PRs are getting ignored. Um, so this is all about uh, open source projects are, are, are competing for contributors. That's what you're doing as an open source project. You're finding contributors. And if you're not handling your, your um, requests for information or your PRs or your issues well, you, the contributors will, will go away. So that's what you're trying to achieve. And there are um, too many, uh, obviously too many PRs and, and issues which are not getting responded to. Um, a, a, a guide for, for, for contributors would be useful, word, which could say something like, if your PR has no answer, then go to this um, this rocket channel and say, please can I have some feedback, please, or something like that. Because now people don't know what to do; they just go away and start contributing on another project. Yep. Uh, Gary, one last thought before we uh, get ready to close. Well, I was just going to say, but you bring up an interesting point, Sean, right? And maybe that was a reverse on my point, right? The project itself is self. Like, <laughs> you 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 reap what you sow. Right. So if you don't accept contributions, you don't follow stuff that's in there, then people will just stop, won't contribute to your project. Right. Good point. Good point. Okay. Um, so I know we're, we're hitting very close to the top of the hour. I want to thank you guys for actually making this an hour long discussion. Um, I really thought we would go no longer than a half an hour. So I think there's been a lot of really good points that have been brought up today. Um, I'm, we'll try and put my notes that I have into the meeting notes and um, let's see what we can do to make some of these things a reality. So with that, I am going to close the call. Will you be sending out a poll for us to uh, judge your uh, performance, Tracy? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs>